we go live here. I'm go ahead. We're ready? Yeah, we're ready. Hi. Rebecca Wendt. This is workshop number one of a series of four. And the reason we're able to have this is because the Albany Farmers Market, which is part of Corvallis Albany Farmers Markets, is uh, was invited to be part of the Beginning Vendor Support Network grant. Our statewide farmers market organization uh, wrote the grant, and I believe they got some other regional funds that I can't mention. No, I can't mention only because I don't remember. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the farmers market promotion uh, program and, or its successor um, is funding this. And we got together with our vendors in Albany, not just the new and beginning ones, but uh, anyone that was interested in the project in Albany last August, and we just sort of brainstormed what are the things that we would like to do with this grant, and we'd already told people about workshops they were interested in, and uh, we just worked, worked our way down from there, and here we are. So when we, when we knew that we, had a, gonna get, we were going to be able to do workshops, um, we contacted uh, Foundry Collective, which is based in Corvallis, but is now uh, operating in various rural parts of the state. And they have an expertise in uh, in food and ag, among other things. Startups, I guess, is your your big entrepreneurism, innovation, all sorts of good stuff. But but it was important to us to work with someone that we knew had some um, affinity for for food and agriculture, and uh, I I knew that to be the case. Um, but Brad had worked in a startup that was. Um, um, Carts and Tools, Carts which and was tools. Uh, one of our um, market vendors, in uh, uh, Michael McGowan was ran our community table in Corvallis for a while, so I believe that's how we met. But it's it's always hard to know around here how you meet people. So uh, we are ready to get going here, and I understand we're all hooked up and ready. You've been ready. streaming live. I'm people have been seeing okay. you. You're famous. If someone could hit the lights real quick, um, and I hate to put you in the dark, but we want to be able for you to be able to see this. So. Um, <laughs> As, as Rebecca said, I'm Brad Attig and I'm with Foundry Collective. Foundry Collective is a nonprofit focused on particularly um, helping locations in, in rural communities uh, foster innovation. And we do that through a philosophy of place-based locations. So we run Corvallis Foundry in um, Corvallis, of course, which is a shared workspace innovation hub. So people can come in and they can join in memberships and for $100, they can have access to hot seat desks for 300, they can have a permanent desk. We have some office space. We do a lot of events there. For the last year, we also ran Pitchfork Incubator Kitchen, which was a shared kitchen space in uh, just over the bridge in Eastgate. And we um, offered a program early this year called uh, Getting on the Shelf, which was an eight week program on how to kind of start um, a business that may be selling and eventually would sell direct to consumers or to stores and everything, kind of the very beginning part of that. So what we're going to talk about tonight is um, getting traction. And one, I want to thank, obviously, the Albany Farmers Market, um, the Oregon Farm Farmers Market, Farmers Market Association. We want to, of course, celebrate this great location and the excellent food that we're having. And, uh, of course, Foundry Collective, we're just putting this on. Um, again, that's me a few years ago, okay? Uh, <laughs> so what are we going to cover today? Well, we're going to cover why social media is critical uh, and digital marketing when you're getting started. We're also going to talk about what traction is and why it's important. We're going to uh, go through a process to help you identify traction channels, and we're also going to do some worksheets. We have worksheets here. We're not actually going to do those worksheets. Those are gonna be available online for you to download. This presentation is also gonna be available for you to download. And by the end or early of next week, there'll be a four or five part workshop series online. You'll be able to actually go through this. We'll have some videos. So don't worry too much about Try to get the concept, but don't grab out pins and start trying to figure out how you're going to conquer the market and, and dominate whatever you might be. So let me ask a question. How many of you are farmers? Austin, how many of you have food businesses you're trying to take to market? How many of you do both? How many of you do everything you possibly can to make a lot of money? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, I like that. So why are we going to start with social media um, and digital marketing? Because it is oftentimes the easiest path to reach people. So traction is what? Traction is that ability to identify if you can get people to be interested 
interested in your product or service, how many people you can get interested in your product and service, and how can you reach and scale that interest? Because we all know we need customers, and we all know it's hard sometimes to get customers. Social media, and we're going to talk through that a little bit before we get into the traction, is a great tool. Now, it's also an incredibly complex tool sometimes, but we're going to work through a little bit of that to try to simplify it. So. I want to talk a little bit about digital and why I talk a lot about social media. There's like seven and a half billion people in the world. Uh, four billion, a little over four billion of those people have access to the internet. A little over three billion are actually active um, on social media channels of some kind. I think five billion people have uh, access to mobile. And uh, what's the other one? Three billion people are active social users. So there's a lot of people out there. I will tell you, I hear from a lot of times when I'm talking to people, they're like, my customers aren't on social media. And I'm like, oh, gee, okay, what part of the 4 billion people, are you, of the 3 billion people that are left over, are you trying to reach? Everybody's on some platform of social media for some reason. Um, active users, I use this slide because I really like the fact that if you look up here, you can see that the 800 pound gorilla is Facebook followed by YouTube. If you then go down through here and log in Instagram, Instagram is owned by Facebook. They dominate the world. Yes. So where does that the light come? I can't really see it. Well, we don't want that. Let's just shut this light off then. How's that? Okay. Can you still see me? Okay. Well, we're good then. So these numbers again are not um, are not critical to to know, other than the fact that. If you're thinking about Pinterest, it's the least. If you're thinking about Facebook, it's the biggest. This can help you decide some of your traction channels. Um, profile of Facebook users, which is very important. One of the things that is important here is to recognize that, yes, 18 to 24 year old, 35 to 34, there's still a lot of people in even older age groups, and that is the fastest growing sector of, a Facebook, uh, of the Facebook platform. E-commerce growth by category, and I use e-commerce growth not only for people that are actively buying online, but people are making decisions if they want to buy a product, even if they're walking down to a farmer's market, to a farm stand, if they're signing up for a CSA or whatever. So it's not necessarily just means who's buying online. But what I like about this is where's the fastest, one of the fastest growing categories? Food and personal care. Okay. That tells you that people that are interested in food are, are, are coming onto Facebook to find out what kinds of food they want to buy, where they want to buy it, what they're looking for, recipes, whatever else. So the fact that that's growing is good news for everybody here in this room. Um, social network share of time. Again, guess what the blue color is? Facebook. So everybody is on Facebook a lot. A little bit of Twitter usage. This is USA over here. A little bit of Instagram, a little bit of Snapchat. Those numbers have probably changed over the last year because this is pretty dynamic. But again, Facebook is probably the place you're going to reach a lot of customers. Actions that on social that prompt customers to purchase. This is critical, okay? What's the number one? Being responsive, okay? Number two is offering promotions. Promotions don't have to be something's on sale. It could be, hey, we've got a great thing going on out at the farm today or we've got um, sign up for the CSA and you get a free gift bag. I mean, it, there's other ways to do it than just giving your product away. But understand that people that engage on your page in social media are engaging and they want a two-way conversation. I will tell you that I go to a lot of um, people's pages and I see 100, 200 unanswered messages. Okay, so if you're going to be out there, engage. If you're not going to engage, don't be there because you're gonna turn off 48% of the people that are out there. So make sure that you are in fact engaging if you're active on the platforms. Some key things to know. Um, social media brands have become platforms on their own. So what does that mean? That means people go to Facebook to find other places to visit. They go to Facebook to look for websites. They go to Facebook to look for um, com companies and brands and recipes and things to engage. They go to YouTube. What do you go to YouTube for? You go to YouTube to either watch silly cat videos or you go there to figure out how to fix something, okay? Or you go there for information on, on something. So you search 
YouTube to find out to learn something. And you may search on a Facebook or an Instagram to find something that you want to consume or some product or, of course, news or something else. So they're a little different. The number one search engine in the world is Google. Number two search engine is YouTube, owned by Google. So they dominate the search engine side of this. And then Facebook dominates this other side of the digital marketing, which is really this interactive dialogue. Um, you know, they're simply tools to deliver your message, however it might be. And these tools, um, you have to use the right tool for the job. So if you've got a certain objective in mind, if you want to sign people up for something, you might use a different platform than if you want to communicate the recipes that you are, in fact, developing around your specific crop that you grew. Maybe you're growing some you know, heirloom squash or something, and you want to say, hey, there's some really interesting ways to do this. You might use two different platforms. Okay, So keep that in mind. You know, And, and think about it. Maybe digital marketing is a, a toolbox, and then in that, there's a bunch of hammers, and you're certainly not going to use a roofing hammer to drive very small brad nails to put in um, trim, unless that's the only hammer you have. So always be thinking about which platform and how do you interact and how does your customer interact with you on what you're trying to achieve? I want to go back real quick. Again, different tools accomplish different jobs. Some key things to know. Every platform works um, at some time and not others. So if you try something once, don't give up on it. It may have been the wrong time. You may have had the wrong message, but don't just say, oh, my customers aren't here or they're not here because I tried it once. Okay. Um, the other part about this is that it takes some time to figure out what works. Um, I liken when you try to start to develop a digital marketing campaign to a stopped freight train. Okay, So when a freight train stops, every car compresses. There's slack in between each one of those connectors. Okay, And when a freight train starts up, the locomotive sometimes, in fact, actually has to run its wheels, its, its rims backwards to generate traction. Then it can start going forward. And it can move. It can move 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 feet, taking out that slack before the caboose moves. And guess what? We're in the caboose. So a lot of people give up too early because they're just starting to get moving, but they haven't moved yet. So be careful and be cautious and be patient. Um, you're going to have natural biases against different platforms, different mechanisms, okay? And I will tell you that biases can help kill your business. Um, someone may say, I don't like Facebook, so I'm not going to be on it. Well, try to, you know, try to separate yourself and your personal feelings from, a, from social media, digital marketing, and platforms and say, is this a tool that I can use for my business, okay? I don't have to be on it. I don't have to be posting on my personal page, but on my business page, I'm gonna have to use this tool. Um, I'll tell you another story. I was down a few years ago at a realtors association down in a county down south, and there were like 60 realtors in there, and I said, how many of you collect email addresses? Every single hand went up. I said, how many of you have a newsletter? You know, about three hands stayed up. And I, I knew the answer, and I said, you know, why don't you use email marketing? Boy, I hate spam. I said, okay. I said, you have to understand something. One person's spam is another person's ham. Just go to Hawaii. <laughs> Secondly, if I give you my email address, what am I expecting to happen? I'm expecting you to contact me, right? I'm, I want to have a dialogue. I want to have a conversation. So how do I feel when I've given you my email address and you never contact me? I'm ignored. I'm just, I might forget, but in most cases, I'm like, hmm, I wonder why I signed up for that. Now, if I'm a realtor and I have a bunch of email addresses of people who just bought homes and all I'm sending them are listings of homes that are for sale when they are not interested in buying another home because they bought one last month, that is spam because I'm not sending them what they want. But if they just bought a house and I'm sending them tips in my newsletter about how to improve their house or what things to look for or you know things to check or um, you know things that would help a new homeowner, then I'm actually providing value in what I'm communicating. And that's where any kind of marketing helps. Think about what your customer is looking for. Think about what they want to hear and try to give that to them. You know, the, um, you know there's a, this thing called the golden rule. And the golden rule is treat others how you want to be treated. There's something also called the platinum rule. Treat others as how they want to be treated. And the platinum rule is kind of the key to really have customers that become advocates and evangelists, and they love your product, and they come back all the time, and they tell their friends, and they're out there saying this is the greatest you know, 
squash in the world or whatever it may be. So if you can give people information that they want and they can find it from you, you are, you've got loyal people. Um, you know, try going where your competition is. And, and this is another one. And, and I don't know how much this may impact some of you, but there's two reasons in most cases that your competitor is not doing something. One, number one reason, they're biased against it. They said, I don't like Facebook. I don't like, I, I don't get Instagram. I don't, I don't understand how to do this, or I just hate it. And so they're not on it because they've already dismissed it. And the second reason is it's probably a little too hard or they tried it and they gave up or they didn't put the effort into it. What does that provide all of you? An incredible opportunity to go someplace where nobody else is. Okay. Now I will tell you when we launched carts and tools about six years ago, you know, what I did find was a ton of small market farmers on there um, with their CSAs. Okay. And that was a great way for us to reach out to them. We haven't been active on that, that Facebook page for a couple of years. And yet we still continue to have a lot of traffic looking at recipes and information and watching the videos about the tools. The tools are still available at Johnny seed catalog and still available online, but we have, we haven't been active there, <clears throat> but because we built up this following by reaching out to the CSAs who a lot of CS used, CSAs used Facebook as a Facebook group or as a page to communicate what was going to be in the boxes and recipes on what to do with the kohlrabi, which was, you know, you're getting 10 pounds of it because it was a bumper year for kohlrabi or something. Uh, they use that very well. I would not not use that if I was doing a CSA, but I might look and say, are all these CSAs on Instagram? And I might spend a little time. And if, you know, only 10% are there, I might say, hmm, maybe I'll put a little more time into Instagram. Um, a couple more key things to know is that, um, you know, you can get leads of people that will buy your product just by people liking, following you. Um, one thing that people don't know, particularly on Facebook, is, you know, down at the bottom, and it says how many people have liked this post. If you click on that, it'll show you the list of those people. It will show you which of those people have liked your page and which ones haven't. And you can click and actually invite them to like your page. Okay. That's a lead, okay, that's an opportunity. That's a potential customer for you. Um, another thing is, is you can get leads of sellers. I don't think that's that important here, but sometimes it might be. Might be a good chance to create some partnerships. Um, you can build your brand, and that's probably one of the most important things. You know, people buy from people, and, and that's really critically important, and people associate, particularly in businesses like yours, they associate you with your brand and your brand with you. So you can use this to develop your brand. Um, you can also, you can look bigger than your competitor. If you're doing a better job and you're putting up cooler pictures and if you're talking a little bit more about things, you, even if your competitor is twice or three times as big as you and they're not doing it, you look better, you look bigger. Um, so. Another thing to keep in mind is even if you're an established and been in business for five or 10 years, if you start using a new platform, you're just a startup. Okay. You don't know if it's going to work. Startups are not businesses. Startups are experiments to see if you have a business. So you're, um, you know, you're, you've got to think about it as a startup. You've got to test and test and test. That's another reason a lot of people give up on all traction channels is they don't, they don't keep testing. They try something and they give up or they try way too many things at one time and they really don't know which one of them worked. So your, your goal here is to figure out what's going to be the best traction channels for you to try and then we're going to learn how to test them. Some channels are better than others, okay? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what stage your business is because that sometimes can, can tell you which channel you might use for traction. If you're an established business, you may not need to go talk to chamber of commerce events or something like that. If you're just getting started, you may want to go to chamber and rotary and whatever else you can and, and talk, talk to those people. Um, we talk a lot about doing things that scale, meaning that you can do that even if you get busier and your business gets bigger. But at the beginning, sometimes you have to do things that don't scale. I can't grow my business um, by simply going to events and talking at events all the time. I only have so many hours in the day and I will kill myself if I keep trying to grow my business by doing something that's sucking all of those hours out of my time. But at the very beginning, that might be the most inexpensive way for me to get in front of people. So be thinking about 
It's just like keeping information on a spreadsheet, okay? When you're only putting in three or four or five emails a day, it's pretty simple. What do you do when you're getting 50 emails a day or 500 emails a day? If you haven't figured out a process to automate that and a better tool, you're kind of in trouble. And what happens? You quit putting emails in, and then pretty soon the people that gave you an email and were really hoping to hear from you don't hear from you, and they go somewhere else because someone else is doing a better job talking with them. Um, and no matter how established your business is, um, you can be at any stage of your business in certain parts. So let's say that you have a farm stand and that's the only thing you have. That's an established business. You've been doing it for three years and you decide to start selling at market. Guess what? That market sale is an entirely new business. And many times we don't think about the fact then we're going to launch a CSA. That is an entirely new business. So be thinking about what the stages is on all of the components of your revenue within your business and say what stage are each one of those. And I want to talk a little bit. Now, this stage is a little different than saying, OK, I've been in business for one year, three years or five years. And it's kind of like it starts with an idea and then planning and then some strategy and then some marketing. And then you start to get some sales and it evolves. But it's important to be thinking about if I've got three different revenue streams, where are each one of those? In addition, how am I going to reach customers in each one of those revenue streams? And how am I going to drive sales, sell more product, and, and have a happier, wealthier, greater life? So I'm going to talk about the bullseye framework. Okay, And I picked this picture for a reason. Because if you're standing there with a bow and arrow, how do you know which target to shoot at? You don't. Okay, And you also don't know which target's going to actually give you the best results. So the process of the bullseye framework is to kind of help us go through these worksheets and figure out which one of those targets we should be shooting at and which one of those targets is going to give us the best return on our investment. So the bullseye framework is a process that's going to help us figure out which platform or which tool we're going to use. OK, and we're going to do a little. What I want you to think about is put yourself in a little bit of a brainstorming session and say, OK, um, you know, what's it going to cost me to do this? OK, how many customers can I get? Um, you know, what's the timeline? How long will it take? And, um, you know, which platform is going to work now and, and down the road? So what we do is, is we start to say, there's 19 ways to get traction. There's probably a lot more than 19 ways to get traction, but we're going to talk about 19 ways to get traction. And we're going to try to figure out how to get down to three. And then we're going to try to figure out how to get down to one. And we're going to try to figure out how to milk the most out of that one, test it, see if it gives us what we want. And then we're going to kind of back up and we're going to know that every traction channel diminishes over time. OK, so we can't just say we've grown our business on this channel. Life is good. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, I'm going to retire with that because traction channels change. And as your business goes through different stages, your customers expect different things and you have competition coming in at where you were. And so you have to be aware that you're going to have to change. We also are going to test. We're going to test and test and test. And we're going to be really focused on one until we really wring the most out of it and know if it's going to work for us or not. So traction thinking. So we're going to fork. Here's what businesses tend to do. They tend to focus on the short stream too much. I cannot tell you how many times people have come in and says, Facebook doesn't work for me. I ran some ads. I'm like, how much did you spend? $20. OK, who did you target? Targeting? I didn't know I could target. OK, what did your ad look like? I, you know, they, 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 they didn't get results immediately. And they, a lot of us like instant gratification. So they gave up too early. That's one of the fatal errors that small businesses make. Second one is, is that a lot of people love their solution to marketing and um, they won't try anything else, okay? Oh, I've got these brochures. I spent a lot of time on them. I spent a lot of money on them and I love my brochures and that's what I'm gonna stick with, okay? There could be something better, okay? So try not to fall in love with the solutions you've come up with. That's also what startups tend to do. Um, individuals come in and they tend to say, I have a problem. I created this solution. OK, I love my solution. You should all love it too. buy it. Write checks for me. And in reality, I was the only person with the problem or all of you have that problem, but you've already figured out 
an easier, simpler, or better way, or you're just not going to change your habits to do something. We've all heard that saying that um, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. It's not true. There's like thousands of patents on all these different mousetraps, and yet we all go to Buy Mart and buy that little wooden one for 59 cents. We don't even have to worry about the cost, and the mouse can be in it. We just throw the whole thing away. Okay? There's humane mousetraps. There's ultrasonic things. There's all these things. They haven't made a dent in the real mousetrap business, but they're all technically better ideas or, or different ideas. Um, the other thing is, is that um, a lot of businesses market as an afterthought. Marketing takes time. Marketing is hard. It doesn't have to be expensive. You have to spend some time and effort to think about it. You can do it relatively inexpensive, but usually it's the last thing people think about. And that also can hurt you quite a bit. Think of, um, because what we do is we tend to work in our businesses and not on our businesses a lot of times. And when we're working in our businesses, we don't have time to think about how getting new customers. When we work on our business and we think a little bit farther out and say, what am I going to try to do in three months, four months, six months out? What marketing would I do today to ensure that three months from now I have people signing up for my CSA? What should I be doing? Should my newsletter continue to go out? How do I... You know, what do I do? Do I survey them to ask them what they thought? So most businesses that don't do well, market as an afterthought, okay? A lot of them fail to test. They just decide they're going to try something. They go find some social media expert or some marketing company, and they're like, you should be on Pinterest. Okay. And then they're on Pinterest. And three months later, they're not getting any results because they really didn't test Pinterest before they really jumped in in both feet. So I am constantly saying, run small tests, see what you learn from it. If it works, do some more of it. If it doesn't work, change it. Don't give up on it, change it, because what you tried might not be the right thing. But, but make sure you're testing. And, and when we test, you know, when we test, we get grades, right? 90% and above, you get an A. What is that? That's a, that's a benchmark standard that's been set. A lot of people will run ads or they'll run, um, they'll do certain things in, in their marketing activities and they don't really set goals and objectives to measure against. They're like, oh, I had 12 people show up. Is that good or bad? Well, I don't know. Well, you had a room that would fit 100 and you had 12 people. You bought enough food for 100 people and you had 12 people. I would say that probably wasn't that good, but they're, you know, they didn't have anything to benchmark or gauge against. So how would you test if you don't have objectives? And the other thing is, is they don't measure results, okay? How many people, you know, looked at your ad? How many people clicked through to your website? How many people signed up for your email list? How many people came to the Rotary Club? Whatever it is, they don't know. They don't measure, okay? Metrics are important, okay? You don't need a ton of metrics, but it's good to get in the mode of saying, okay, did this work and what did it do? Um, and also, um, they don't track their return on investment, ROI. Okay, so they don't look and say, I ran an ad for $25 and it generated $300 in sales. Should I do more of that? Probably. Okay, the real question is, is did you make money off that? So, you know, the question really is, if I run, if, if I can run an ad and if I can make, if it costs me $50 to get a customer and every time I get a customer, I make a hundred bucks, I'm going to be spending $5,000 a day on ads. Okay, because I know what I'm making off each one of those customers. So know what you're trying to figure out, a return on investment doesn't have to be complex. Just kind of say, okay, I make a hundred bucks off everybody that signs up for my CSA and it costs me $20 to get someone to sign up if I'm using this platform to connect with them. Am I happy at $80? And if I am, I'm gonna spend some more money. If I'm not, I'm gonna look for something else. A um, lot of confusion about marketing, traction and advertising. Marketing is a tactical activity, okay? What's that mean? I'm going to run a newspaper ad. I'm going to go to the Rotary. I'm going to hire a salesperson. I'm going to go into the farmer's market. I'm going to set up a farm stand. That's a tactical activity, okay? You can stop it at any time. Traction is strategic. Traction is actually thinking ahead in the future and saying, how do I, in fact, make decisions that are going to impact my business down the road? And then advertising is just a tool, okay? Placing a newspaper ad running a Facebook ad, doing something like that, that's, that's just a tool. Okay, you run it, it's done. It's one of your hammers. So I want to talk about the 19 types of traction, okay? Viral marketing, we all probably have heard about viral marketing, getting fans to share. Now, the viral marketing we want is some influencer to, you know, pick up a 
something we did and they've got a million followers and all of a sudden we have more orders for our jam than we possibly can ever fulfill. But it doesn't have to be that. It's just encouraging people to share. Okay. Part of that is, is if you like what I'm doing, would you mind sharing it with your friends on your social media channel? Just ask. Okay. The easiest way to develop viral marketing is to ask people to share. Most people, if they like what you're doing, are more than willing to share. Okay. Don't just like my post. Would you share my post? Okay. And if you share my post or if you're going to like my post, would you comment on it and tag your friends that you think might like it? Because if you tag someone in a post, guess what? They're going to get a notification about that post. Ask. Most people will do that. Uh, public relations, and don't worry about writing these down. These will all be in the online portion of this that I'll have available for you. Public relations, newspaper, TV, uh, radio, going on and talking to, to people, you know, doing um, something to get you out in front of that. Unconventional PR stunts, you know, flash mob type things may or may not work for you, but it is a type of traction. Search engine marketing, search engine marketing versus search engine optimization search engine marketing is making your platform if you're on a website easier for people to find so when they type in keywords or they do a search for a certain product or a certain item you come up higher in the rankings okay there's a lot of companies will come to you and tell you i can help you get increase your ranking get you on the first page of google and they'll charge you a lot of money for it um, there's some pretty good articles where you can figure that out yourself search engine marketing Unless you're doing a ton of like online business or using online portals to drive a lot of ton, a lot of business to your to your your store or your or your or your business may not be a great investment. Another one is offline ads, uh, you know, newspaper billboards, okay, something like that. Search engine optimization is uh, another part of this that ties back into search engine marketing. Uh, content marketing, writing blogs, okay? Blogs used to be a huge thing. You used to write these blogs, and the idea was is you wrote these blogs on your website, and then you put them on the social media channel, and then when someone clicked on the blog, and you put it in your newsletter, and when someone clicked on it, it brought them back to your website, and then you got them to your website, and you tried to convert them to something. Um, content marketing, for the most part, now is visual. Okay, if you look at things like Instagram, okay, it's content marketing, it's just photographs, okay, but it's still content and people look at the photograph and they click on it and they can see the website, they can see information about you. Videos shot with little uh, phones and things, 30 second videos, that's content. So we don't have to be prolific writers anymore to create good content that people are interested in consuming. And if they like your content and you communicate back and forth with them when they comment, they're more likely to become customers for life. Email marketing, still the most affordable way to reach customers. Every chance you have, get email addresses, and then make sure that when people give you email addresses, you're doing what? You're getting back to them. You're communicating with them. You're having a dialogue. Still the most inexpensive way to reach people. Um, e engineering marketing, probably not going to happen here. It's building like an app or something that goes out there that does something that helps drive people back to your platform or something. We, we're, that's not going to work for us. Um, targeted blogs, a little bit different. That's where you're trying to get someone else to write about you, okay, that has a following so that you're getting some publicity. There's a thing called affiliate marketing that's out there that's where people are writing about a product that you're trying to sell. And if they send you to their, your website, if they send them to your website, they get a percentage of that sale. So that's part of how this works. Business development, strategic partnerships, okay. Um, you sell honey, I sell ice cream, let's come together and figure out some honey flavored ice cream. That could be a strategic partnership. Sales, we all know what that is. Affiliate programs, I just talked a little bit about that. The existing platforms, Facebook and YouTube, okay? Trade shows, we know what those are. Offline events, meetups, happy hours, um, any kind of event where you can talk with people about your business is still a way to get traction. Um, speaking engagements, going to the Rotary Chambers and other locations and talking about your business and what you're trying to do and what's new and what's unique about it. And then community build, <coughs> excuse me, community building, creating evangelists. So we talk a lot about evangelists.
times. So evangelists are typically people that use your product or service. Okay, these are people that are buying from you. These are the people that are at your door before you open. They love what you what you sell, what you produce, what you grow, what you make, and they use it. Okay, advocates. Advocates just love what you're doing. They may not even use your product, okay? If you're growing grass-fed beef, and they might be a vegetarian, but they might be an advocate for you because you are using humane growing practices and all sorts of other things. So they will talk you up, and they'll talk nicely about you, even if they don't use your product. A little bit of difference there. Not a huge difference, but just keep in mind that sometimes your communication methods with those are different. You really want to reward your, your evangelists and you want to thank them as often as you can and however, whatever mechanism you can. The advocates, you probably want to keep them informed of what you're doing that keeps them as advocates for you. A little bit of difference there. So one of the things you're going to have in your package is a three traction channels that you've tried. We're not going to do that tonight, but I want you to think a little about what have you tried? Okay. I tried Facebook ads. They didn't work. Okay. I tried, uh, I, I tried a stand someplace on the corner. It didn't work. I went and talked to a bunch of people at a, I stood outside the mall with a billboard, a sign or something. Those are traction channels that you've tried. Okay. One of the things I'd like to do is to try to figure out what were the results and why it did it or did it not work. Okay. You're not going to necessarily know all of it, but kind of go back and do a little post-mortem and say to yourself, hmm, wonder why that didn't work. Oh, it was 28 degrees and snowing that day. Or, I, you know, my customer is X to Y, and those people that showed up were Zs or something like that. So one thing I encourage you is to look backwards and say, what have I done? Looking at these 19 traction channels and figure out if you've tried some of them and they have or have not worked, Okay. The next thing is, is I'd like you to go through over the next week or so and start to look at these channels. You don't have to do all of them, but look at them and say, which ones do I think most likely might work for me? Okay. And you can rank them from one to five. And I don't care if one is top or five is top. There's no, nothing here. And then the dollars, the CAC is the cost of acquisition. Okay. What did it cost or what would it cost to get a customer? What do I think? I'm guessing. I'm just pulling this out of thin air and I'm saying, I think if I were to run ads, I could get a customer for $10. I think if I bought a billboard, I might get 20 customers, but the billboard is going to cost me $20,000 and I'm going to be spending $1,000 per customer. I don't know, but at least I'm taking a guess. And then how many customers do I think I could get? And again, you don't have to do all of these, but can I get 10 new customers? Can I get five new customers? Can I get 100 new customers? And how long would it take? Okay, because if I can get five new customers in a week and, that, and it's not costing me a ton, that's good. If it's going to take me a year to get five new customers, it may not be good. So this is, a, this is just, again, part of this brainstorming that I'd like you to kind of work through. Again, you don't have to do every single one. There's some you're just going to say, I'm not doing engineering marketing. It's a zero or it's a six, depending on how you're ranking it. Um, and then what you start to do is you start to go through that list and you start to define your bullseye, okay? Which ones are not likely to work right now? Which ones might work? And which ones do I really think will work? And the reason we try to go through a lot of channels is why? Because I just said, these traction channels change over time. So you can refer back to this and say, last year, this is where I was. And this year, my business has matured. I've entered into a new business. I'm doing something different. We've rebranded. We're, we're, we're changed. We've added items to our assortment. We've, we've pivoted. We've moved to a new piece of property. We've, we've got organic certification. We've done something different. And you might look at this and you might suddenly might say, hmm, some of my some of my inner circles are no longer working for me or don't seem like they're appropriate, but yet some of my potentials might be something that I would like to use. The next thing is, is you have this little form here that's, a, that's, a, that's kind of your channel test strategy. And I, I talk about doing three because I think three really helps you. And what we're looking at is, what is it? What do we think it's going to cost us to test? Okay. What do we think? The customers we're going to get, what well, cost is for a customer, and then are the customer fits good? And the next one I love to talk through. So um, what I've done here is I've kind of gone through a few different ones. One, speaking engagements. Well, it doesn't cost a lot to do a speaking engagement. It's pretty much your time, right? If you're going to drive there in your time, it's free. 
okay? But the customer fit could be average. I don't really know who's going to be at that event. If I go to a Rotary Club, I don't really know <clears throat> if all of those people are going to be interested in my product, none of those people are going to be interested in my product, or some of them. I don't have any way to define um, how good that customer fit's going to be. So it could be average. I'm going to run a Facebook ad. Okay, well, what do I have to do? I have to check the scheduling so I know the timing, and I'm going to take me about six hours of time. I'm going to run a Facebook ad. I'm going to spend $150 over two weeks, and I think that <clears throat> I'll get customer leads for $2.50 each. And I know because on Facebook ads, I can target to what? I can target to behaviors and interests and demographics. So I can really target in on who I think my customer is going to be. I can say that my customer is a 35 to 45 year old woman, okay, with two, two children, okay, with a household income of $30,000 or more that lives within five miles or 10 miles of my zip code. I can target to that level. So <clears throat> again, I think that's my customer, okay? I don't know until I test, but I think that's my customer. So I think when I run a Facebook ad or uh, any of the other ads where you can do this kind of deep targeting, that my customer fit is going to be pretty good, okay? What's it gonna take me? Uh, I'm gonna run two ads, $5 each day with a local focus. It's gonna take me a couple hours. However, I gotta learn how to place Facebook local ads and that might take me forever, okay? So I might have to really, even though the cost might only be 150 bucks, I might invest 10, 20 hours to really get good at it. And then the third one I put down here was public relations, you know, sending a press release out. I'm sending it to the Florence Flyer and Johans Yeller and two hours. However, I've never written a press release before, so I'm gonna spend eight hours watching YouTube videos learning how to write a press release, okay? So kind of think about not only the cost, the opportunity cost of lost hours. And what this can do then is, it's gonna come up with some things and say, hmm, should I do the press release before or after I talk to the Rotary? I don't know. Should I uh, run the Facebook ad before or after I do the press release? So you're gonna look at these three items and you're gonna try to figure out some orders that you might do these in because that might matter too. Do I need to set up Facebook business profile to run an ad? So now we're actually gonna stop the live streaming. We're gonna shut these lights off and we're gonna talk just a little bit about individual questions you may have and they can be absolutely anything. Is that light?